So God's grace is mercy and his peace to you in Jesus. Um, so we're, we're working through these passages in Mark. And this is an interesting one because, you know, we don't fast for religious reasons, do we? We fast to lose weight. <laughs> you, know, or we, you know, we fast for other reasons. Um, you might be prepping for trying to fit into a piece of clothing or, you know, whatever it is for an event or something like that. But that's not how it's used here in Scripture. There's no, no concept of that in ancient times. But fasting was not an uncommon occurrence in, in what happened. So you have this two, these two parts to Jesus' teaching here about, and I'm calling this the fast and the past. So that's how we're going to look at this. So what, is, what are we going to learn about the fast? And what are we going to learn about Jesus talking about the past? So uh, when I was in seminary, I bartended my way through seminary. So I could graduate. Does that sound horrible? Is that horrible? Does that sound very unholy of me? It was awesome. I loved it. I had the best, most well-behaved bar in St. Louis, I guarantee you. That's why the, he wouldn't hire me at first, because he said, you won't let him drink enough. I said, no, you watch. We'll have fun. We'll have a good time. And they, once they found out I was, I was like studying to be a pastor, they all wanted free counseling. I mean, it was crazy. They don't come to the bar. But I, I, uh, I decided to start making beer. Because they had these beers on tap, all St. Louis beers, and then this one English beer. And uh, I said, man, I want to try something. I want to try that. Never made beer before. Bought the gear. Bought this equipment. And uh, me and a buddy started making beer. And so I didn't know what I was doing. And I am notorious for not reading directions. Notorious. Yeah, shut up. <laughs> That's my son-in-law. <laughs> He reads all the directions. Like we're putting in these lights. I'm just putting them up there, and he's reading the book. Yeah, God bless you. That's why they work. Um, so I make beer, right? So I make beer. And we're in seminary in this tiny little shoebox of an apartment, so I didn't have anywhere to put it, so I put it in the coat closet, closed the door. It exploded because I didn't read the directions. You're supposed to put a valve like on the top so that it can release the gases it didn't release the gas. Well, it did release the gases, actually, all over the clothing inside the uh, coat closet. So the reason this is a significant thing is Jesus is using that example. You don't put new wine into those old wine. they got no room to stretch, man. There's no room to stretch. So what do you do? There's, a, there's two big things going on here, which I'll share it with you. But the idea is you got to have some release valves for new things. you got to have a way for new things to take place. Um, without abandoning the past or disparaging the past, ridiculing the past. And so we got to avoid two things, right? We got to avoid the idolatry of, oh, the old things are better, right? And the idolatry of all the old things stink and we're, re we're way cool, right? You got to avoid those. Both of those are idols. Jesus is calling them out. And so let's look at it. Let's look at it together. So there's two different, different spots here, the fast and the past. So the first, the question that's really before them, because they come to Jesus and they go, hey, they're fasting, we fast, how come you not? Now in Jewish law, there was only one day that you were required to fast. Anybody know it offhand? I bet you could guess it if you know a little bit of Jewish festival. Hmm? Yom Kippur, right, very good, Day of Atonement. One day, you were only required to fast one day. But the Pharisees, remember those are the real religious guys in Jesus' day? And Jesus is sharp with them a lot. Um, they had added Mondays and Thursdays. So you, they also were required. And they made it into a rule. It's not in the Bible. Lutherans get really anxious when you start telling me you got to do this thing and we can't find it in the Bible. We don't, no, I, we don't like that. Now, there are some things we choose to do, like observing Lent. That's not in the Bible, but we choose to do it. And if you don't do it, I don't show up at your door and ridicule you for not observing Lent. That's, that's, that's not how we go. You can choose to do it. But the Pharisees had made it a law. So Jesus wants, needs to step into this. He does in the Sermon on the Mount, too, because here's the question at hand. How do you measure how Christian somebody is, how godly they are? Now, if you remember a few months ago, we did a whole bunch of passages from Matthew. Remember Matthew, the tax collector? They all hated his guts. 
And, and you know what I said week after week after week after week? Jesus is trying, and Matthew's remembering, Jesus is reminding people, stop keeping score. That's what we just confessed here. Lord, forgive me when I keep score. Because I keep score with me, too, by the way. On myself and on others. I'm tempted to a lot, too often. Why won't they do that thing? How come I can't do this thing? And then I keep score. And so how do you keep score? Jesus talks about it in the Sermon on the Mount at great length, right? And many of them, like for religious people, was what? How often do you go to church? You observe the Sabbath, right? How well do you observe the Sabbath? And by the way, pastors are the greatest of all offenders in observing the Sabbath, right? You too. You're in trouble, buddy. Um, you too. <laughs> No, I mean, we work on the, we work on the Sabbath day. Actually, I love being here with you, so it's a blast. And I'm hoping I'm honoring God. So anyway, we'll give that a try. So, the first, so how often do you observe the Sabbath? Do you tithe, right? Do you give generously? Do you uh, fast? And do you pray? Those are the ones, right? That's the whole list. And, and then there's more. But I mean, Jesus addresses those. And you know what he says, don't you know this? You know this. Because that's how they were keeping score. How, much, how good a believer are you? How holy are you? How pious are you? How, how right are you in the eyes of God? And so they had a whole list of stuff to do. Not just the Ten Commandments, but a whole bunch of lists. You know this. So the question is, how are you doing on that? How are you keeping score? And Jesus goes into it, and you remember what his, essentially what his, uh, his counsel is almost on all those things? Don't, let any, don't tell anybody. The Pharisees and the religious leaders were going around praying like out in, out in public. They took great pride in their great flowery prayers. Um, I, had a, I had a roommate in college who I remember when I saw him as a pastor. He's the coolest guy. Loved this guy. So great. All of a sudden, I went to the first church service I saw him lead. And as he came out, I said, who was that dude up there? And he's going, what are you talking about? I said, you... I'd never heard you talk like that. You know, it's like this, oh, Lord, you know, that kind of thing. And, you know, just get into this flowery stuff. And I go, I remember thinking in my head, I'm never doing that. So if I'm not reverent enough, please forgive me. But I'm trying to just have a conversation with God, you know. Um, But anyway, but the Pharisees were out doing that. Hey, everybody look at me praying, right? Check me out praying. And then giving, right? They go to the money changer because their coin was not paper. It was not quiet. It was loud money. And they'd take it and dump it in slowly. Clack, 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 right? Check me out. And then, of course, when they were fasting, they'd go around like this. Oh, I haven't eaten two days. You know, right? That kind of thing. Jesus says that with strained faces. You walk around with strained faces. Check me out. Look how pious I am. So all of these different things. And it was really interesting because I remember one of the things I love. I'll tell you, I love electronic giving, like for giving here at church. We kind of had to go to it in the pandemic, but I actually love it. And my dad hated it. My dad would be 108 this year. And so he died at 93. And for the few years he was here with me, we started doing electronic giving. I said, Dad, I love this. He goes, why do you like it? I hate it. I said, I love it because you know what? It's first fruit giving, right? I have to be intentional about it. I have to plan it. I have to think about it. What percentage of my income? What can it be? Instead of like, oh, right? What have I got today? I mean, it's intentional. It's planned. um, And nobody sees me do it, which is what Jesus says. Right? Don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing. And my dad, who grew up in the church, he was like, i got to give an offering. i got to give an offering. I don't know what to do. I can't do that. So anyway, I set him up on electronic giving, and then we gave him little stickers to put on his offering envelope that said, I already gave. I'm not a cheapskate. You know, something like that. I don't know. I already gave is what it said. So that he could then put it in the plate. Because that was a critical Again, he, was, he grew up in a whole other generation. That was a critical act for him. But I go, Dad, whose opinion matters? Because he was worried. People might think he wasn't giving if they didn't see him put something in the plate. And, and this is the interesting thing on this, because it's not what. Here's the point. What proves our piety, pi, our, our piety? Ty, you got that next one? It's more who than what. For the religious, it's what. Give me the checklist. What are the things I need to do? For the faithful, it's who. Who are you doing this for? 
right? Conversation with God. And we'll get to this in the fasting point. I'll, probably, I'll, I'll give it away. Fasting is not about denying ourselves necessarily. It's not about an act of sacrifice. Fasting is about opening us up to God doing something. That's what fasting is about. Okay, so the first one is who's keeping score? Who proves our piety? It's far more who than what. Because you know where score was kept? I'll tell you, there was score kept right there. On Good Friday, you're going to see that that's where the score was posted. And that's the place that God kept score, on his own son, on our behalf, not keeping score on you. Okay, second thing. So Christopher Walken, do you know that guy? He often plays bad guys. So it's notorious for this guy. He'd be in a movie, go to a set. And he would be sitting in the trailer, getting his makeup on for the first for shooting and so forth. And he would just drop this to the makeup girl. He would say, oh, yeah, it's my birthday today. And he would just make that and pass. So she's like, oh, it's Christopher Walken's birthday. So she gets out, done with the makeup, running all over the, the, the stage, you know, everywhere, saying, it's Christopher Walken's birthday. So they go out and buy cakes and cupcakes, and they get stuff and balloons and a big party. And it was never his birthday. But he did that to lighten the mood, to lighten the mood and the tension for people to have fun. Second point is this. Do we live the Christian life as if it's a funeral or a wedding? God bless you, Cheryl, for being here today. Thanks for living it like it's a wedding. Because here, um, because the Pharisees were living their life in God as a funeral about things they had lost, things they were giving up, things that they were sacrificing, as opposed to a wedding, which is, look what I'm getting. Look what's ahead of me. Look at how I can celebrate. Jesus was living as a wedding. Jesus says, I'm the bridegroom. They ain't mourning while I'm here. We ain't wasting our time. And here's the neatest thing of all for followers of Jesus Christ, because for Jesus' followers, they didn't quite get it yet. It's really Pentecost when it all comes clean to them, all comes clear. Not even at the resurrection, they don't quite get it. It's at, the, it's at Pentecost where they really get it. But for us, we who know, when is Jesus not here? Always with you, never apart from you. I mean, even in that horrifying moment, not abandoned. I'm just waiting to see what God's going to do. What's, what's he going to do? What's he going to say? And so is it either a funeral or a wedding? And Jesus is challenging us to live it like a wedding. And, and here's the thing. If I make a personal comment, a pastoral comment on that, I would say we would, it would do us well to change our attitudes about both those things. About funerals to make them truly celebrations. Okay? And often we say that and we don't pull it off but to truly make it a celebration so that death never gets the last word for a follower of Jesus Christ. Death never gets the last word because of Easter. But at the same time, so I want to make, I want to make funerals more lighthearted. Like when my dad passed away um, and my brothers were here, I worried about this afterwards because anyway, we're greeting everybody who came. People were wonderful to us, very nice. And so we're greeting them as they're arriving. And then it's like, I'm like, hey, guys, we got to get in, my two brothers and our families. Hey, we got to go in. We came walking in, talking and laughing and doing all this stuff, walking. And, I, and afterwards, I said, I wonder if we offended a whole bunch of people because we weren't somber enough. And I was really, in, I don't know, no one ever said anything to me. But I said, but I think we were right to come in like that because I was so glad he was home. I was so glad he was home. And I'm looking forward to seeing him again. But, but it was, it's interesting. A funeral could be a little more like that. But a wedding could have a little more weight to it than most of the ones I do. A little more weight to it. A little more, this is awesome. Because look at what God has done. Look at how God is filling, presiding, transforming. Wouldn't it be cool if a wedding was a little richer? A little more. A little cele more, you know, I mean... It's not just the party people, okay? Like I joke about this at weddings. Nobody comes to hear what I got to say. They're, they're there to see the bride. Wouldn't it be cool if they actually did come to hear what I had to say? And that what we did made it, made it more meaningful, more meaningful? Anyway, that's that. Okay, third one. So this is the third part of the fast. 
Is it an invitation or a rejection or a refutation? The Pharisees were doing a fast to call out the culture. You people that are just eating and drinking and doing whatever you want, we reject you. We refute you. And that is not why God has established the fast. While it's not required of us, uh, there are times when having a fast is okay. To stop for a moment and say, you know what, I'm not going to listen to the news for the next week. To stop and say, I'm going to change my radio station for the next 30 days. To stop and say, I'm going to eat a little bit differently, or I'm going to remember people who have less than me, or whatever it is, right? Those kinds of fasts, not, those can be of great benefit. But not as a rejection of something, but rather as an invitation for God to come. Like when Joel has it. So, Emma, thanks for reading. And when we read that Joel passage, that's from Ash Wednesday. You know, return to me with all your hearts. Rend your heart, not your clothes. Right? You get it. Open your heart. Tear open your heart. Why? Because a fast then is an invitation. And so that's the idea of the fast. Those three things. The second half of this, the past. You know the seven, the seven last words of a dying church is an old cliche. We've never done it that way before. Right? Seven last words of a dying church. Now, let me tell you, seven, let me tell you the words of a dying church as well. We think the past stinks. <laughs> and we reject it. That's death too. So this is a both and. This is a both and thing. Because, and I've talked to you about it this way before, if the center doesn't hold, if the center doesn't hold, it all unravels. So, so we're, doing, we're going to do some building projects here. We're going to share it with you and then ask for the congregation to cheer. We're going to see what we got. Because we, we think we got all the money in hand already. But we're going to blow out the back of the church there. Not these walls. This also, it all looked the same. But this is going to get a little bigger. We're going to push out a little bit. Because this building serves not just for worship. We do it for school programs, theater, drama, all kinds of things. So this is going to come out a little bit. we got lighting changing. We're going to have, anyway, room back there. And then we're going to expand our prayer chapel from 50 seats to 170 seats. So our 5 o'clock service can go in there and then school events and things like that. It's going to be way cool. So we're right now getting bids. <clears throat> so I've been in, I think I counted, I am now up to 19 building projects in my ministry. So 19 of those. And in them, I love being involved in it because, you know what's interesting? This may come as a revelation. You do not build the building out of the same materials and processes that you build the foundation. Did you know that? That's a joke. Of course not. Because in the foundation, you're compacting dirt, you're removing some, you've got engineered fill, you have to follow exact footings, you've got to go below the frost line, it's got to be reinforced concrete. You don't build your walls and your classrooms and your roof out of reinforced, rebarred concrete. You just don't. It's dumb. You could. It's dumb. But you build the foundation out of it. Because you don't, you can't move. Jesus is not condemning the past here. What he's saying is, stop taking the way you do things from the past and putting new stuff in it. Can bust them wide open. But do you notice in the text here at all that Jesus is Jesus saying, hey, take all that old wine and throw it away, it's no good? It doesn't say that. He says you need new wines, kids, for new wine. But you know what the best tasting wine is? The old stuff. Ooh, it's good. Had lots of time to get aged and beautiful. And that new wine, not so yummy, because it takes a while. Right? So it's a really interesting metaphor. So what you're not building, you don't build your building out of the foundation stuff. In fact, it's great to build a building out of stuff that can change and get added to and go this way. But your foundation has to be dead on solid right. Like I tell this to people, I don't laugh and talk about how great it is to be Lutheran. When we get it right, this is when we get it right in our denomination Get that foundation as solid as a rock, as biblical grounded as we can do it, and from that foundation, we can, go, we can go nuts. We can build all kinds of structures and facilities and tools and ways to be able to reach our community, reach our kids, bless our families, and so forth. So the first thing is this, 
is seeing new ideas as sinful is a problem. And there's some people that cling so hard to the past that they see all new ideas as sinful. By the way, that was the accusation of the Reformation. Luther and the Reformation was, oh, it's all these new ideas. And here's the irony. All, what Luther was doing is saying, no, you guys have all the new ideas. We're going to go back to this, this one. We're going to find out how the early church operated, and we're going to go from there and build the house of God and build the structure. So seeing new eyes, like I have a t-shirt that's great. I have a t-shirt that's great. It's a Reformation t-shirt. And the quote is this. No, um, he says, uh, the door was fine. It's about Luther and the Reformation. The door was fine. I was just hammering on it to fix your theology. Yeah, that's funny. I think it's funny. Okay. <laughs> so it's not an attack on the foundation, but a fix of the structure. Jesus, what Jesus is talking about. Second thing, what's the purpose of the past? Isn't it ironic that the Jews were constantly yearning for the past. They were year days of David and Solomon, the days when we were God's chosen people. And, we, and you know what's funny? They forgot all the horrible generations where they did anything they wanted and disobeyed God and, and they turned away from God and nothing went well. It's like my dad. This is the third time I'm referencing my dad. This is very interesting. He was constantly saying how good the old stuff was, Right? Oh, the old days, so much better. And I would say, oh, so in the 50s there were no teenage pregnancies. Well, I didn't know about them. I go, that's the point, right? All these people were going through the same broken things that we experience today, and yet we, 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 we have struggled generation after generation after generation. And so what's the purpose of the past? It's not for us to yearn to recreate the past, because we too conveniently forget, but it is a foundation that we never forget. A foundation upon which we build. So when we have the right wine in the right skins, every bit of it is blessed. When the old wine, that beautiful aged, beautiful wine that, that, that Isaiah talks about in Isaiah 25. The finest of meats and aged wine, how beautiful that is. That's a good thing. That is so good. And in fact, it's how you learn to make the new wine. And when that new wine is a new wine skit, allowing it to expand, to grow, to try, to enrich until it becomes a drinkable wine, what a blessing that all of it can be blessed. And then the last thing is this. What's the past good for? Building on the past. When we build on the past, on the scriptures, on those things that have happened, those foundations that don't change, it gives us a fresh experience of the living God. Because upon it, we can build. And on those, we build new things, grounded in God's word, grounded in his eternity, his eternal promises, which are to the glory of God. So there's a fasting that's appropriate. A fasting, which is an invitation for God to act. And there's a celebration of the past, which rejoices in what God can be doing tomorrow, built on his foundation of word and promise. That's our blessing, and I pray it blesses you too. Amen.